take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, B. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I was a bit hesitant because um, I am indeed not a religious uh, studies person. Um, let me tell you a little bit how Myanmar came to me. I didn't come to Myanmar. Um, last year in April, I think, um, I got an email from uh, a German colleague saying, look, we are one of the German political foundations. We work in Myanmar and we have a special focus on federalism and the federalism debate in Myanmar. And we have one expert who works with us regularly, who is a colleague of yours. And unfortunately, he had to cancel for one of our events we had planned in May. And he has recommended you, that we contact you. And at that time, I was like, okay, um, why not? I've never been to that part of the world. Um, didn't know anything about Myanmar. First thing I did is, you know, what I would never tell my students, looked up on Wikipedia, <laughs> there is Myanmar, <laughs> what's going on there? And I said that to the colleague, I said, look, I'm happy to come, but you have to know I know nothing about the country. Right? I mean, I've heard on the news that there were protests, and surely you've come across the name Aung San Suu Kyi, but I didn't really know what was going on. Um, a year and a half later, I've been to Myanmar seven times now. Um, know a bit more than I, than I knew then, have been to a few places in Myanmar, um, and um, become really, really fascinated by the country. When I travel there, I sometimes joke with the people, I say, look, there's two things in life I really, really don't like. Uh, the first thing is I don't like abnormal heat when it gets beyond 35 degrees. Now, Myanmar is in the tropical climate zone. You have that even on a winter's day, right? The second thing I don't particularly like is rice, <laughs> right? So I'm not a big rice fan. Um, they eat a lot of rice in Myanmar for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, and so I say to people, look, I don't like heat and I don't like rice, and I keep coming back. So there must be something special about the country that makes me come back. It's cer certainly not the weather or the food, right? Um, and, and I think that's a little bit the story of me and Myanmar, that the country found me and fascinated me and keeps fascinating me in, in its many facets. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, conflicts in Myanmar and a little bit about the history of the country and the current situation and challenges, and um, then tell you a little bit about the work that I've been doing the last year and a half or so in the country. And... Um, when I can, I bring in the religious dimension because there is an important religious dimension to the conflict. So this is Myanmar. Myanmar is a very odd country. Um, it's a country between two very big countries, between India and China. Right? It's a country that um, geographically you kind of have everything. You have deep-rooted jungle. right? If you look for it, on the whole border with Thailand, that's basically jungle. Okay, if you go up in the north in the mountains, um, you'll get snow, right? If you go to Chin State in the north, you get your snow. Um, you'll get very pleasant climate, particularly Mandalay northwards in Chan State. This is when the, the, the beginnings of the Himalayas, this is where the nicest climate is. So, you know, and my, my favorite city to work in is Taungji, you see on here, because this is where very pleasant climate is. Um, it's also a very strange country because it has changed a lot. It has changed a lot because, well, in 1989, the then military government decided to change the name of the country, the name of certain cities. So um, Yangon used to be Rangoon, Myanmar used to be Burma, right? But it has also changed a lot because since 2010, you have democratic elections. You actually have a democratic parliament and a democratic government. Still quite a few problems, and I will talk about them. But this is really one of the countries of the youngest examples of democratization that we know. Right? There aren't many other examples. And it's been relatively successful. People always underestimate that. But, you know, um, we actually had an exchange of elites in Myanmar. Right? That's more than we can say, for example, in Zimbabwe. 
where one dictator seems to have, you know, exchanged another one. So in Myanmar, we actually had one party handing over power to another party. And that other party was a party that was oppressed for 30 years, the National League for Democracy, led by Aung San Suu Kyi. So it's a very, very fascinating country. Um, it's currently divided into eight states and eight regions. Now, the eight states are important because this is where minority groups live. And many of these minority groups have minority religions. Okay, the vast majority of the population in Myanmar is Buddhist. Okay, but you have important Christian minorities. The Kachin in the north, the Chin in the northeast, um, these are, uh, sorry, in the northwest, these are Christians. Right, strong Christian communities. You also um, have a few Hindus in the country. Uh, you have a few Confucian representatives. You have 600,000 Catholics. Right? Um, so the Pope was, happened to be in Myanmar at the same time I was there. Um, coincidences? 600,000 um, um, Catholics, and you also have over 2.5 million Muslims. That number has recently substantially reduced because of the forced expulsion of the Rohingya minority. We'll talk about the Rohingya problem. You can see Rakhine State. And the Rohingya basically live north of Sitwe. Okay? So that's where they are forced into Bangladesh. Okay? So we can talk about this in a minute. Now, this gives you an idea of the ethnic groups. Okay? The by far biggest groups are ethnic uh, Bormen or Barma. Okay? Uh, they are literally all Buddhist. Okay. Then you have other groups which are, again, exclusively follow one religion. So all Kachin are Christians. All Chin are Christians. And then you have groups which are divided. So for example, the Shan. You find Shan Christians, but you also find Shan Buddhists. Okay. Uh, the Kaya are quite interesting. Um, because the Kaya um, in the East... Uh, used to be Christian, who then forcefully have been converted to Buddhism. Um, and so you still have some that stuck with, with Christianity, some that have adopted uh, Buddhism. Okay, so you have um, a number, quite a mix, but it looks more than it is. Um, I tried to find some statistics. It's very hard to find statistics. Um, I'm pretty sure this statistic is not correct. I don't think it's 87% Muslims. I think the number is a bit lower than that. But you can probably surely say three out of uh, four people are Buddhists. Okay. Um, simply because also where the Burma live in central uh, uh, Burma, this is where the majority of the population is. You have about 15% of the population live in, in the biggest city in Yangon, in Ragoon. Okay. Um, and when you go north to Kachin State or Chin State, they are very sparsely populated, partly because of the climate and the uh, geography there, partly also because of a lot of ethnic conflicts, which um, forced a lot of people to flee. Okay. Uh, now again, here you see the Rohingya area, so that's on the border with Bangladesh. Um, basically, there's two perspectives on the Rohingya. The uh, majority Myanmar opinion is these are immigrants. So they would never refer to them as Rohingya because Rohingya is a claim that they are their own ethnic group. They refer to them as Bengalis, which means they're immigrants from uh, Bangladesh. Okay? And the argument is you have illegally come to Myanmar, you've illegally occupied land, you're illegally using agriculture and fishing, and um, that's a threat for the local Rakhine population. Of course, you know, there is some objective history. Um, I still believe in facts. Many people don't anymore, but I do. Uh, many of the Rohingyas have been there for um, at least two to three hundred years. So it is true that they are immigrants at some point. Their predecessors were. They came from Bangladesh when the British began to conquer parts of India. Right? And they began to settle there. So, yes, they come from Bangladesh, but they came like 200 years ago. So that raises an important question, which I'm sure B knows more about than me, 
it's a question of, um, particularly in Southeast Asia, how long do you have to live somewhere before you stop being an immigrant? Right? It clearly is not enough to be born there and raised there. And, you know, I mean, many of the Rohingya exclusively speak Burmese. Right? They don't speak any more Urdu or any other language spoken in Bangladesh. They speak Burmese. Right? They've been socialized in Burmese. The only difference, the only characteristic difference is that they are Muslims. Okay. Um, and here you get an idea of the groups that you find in Myanmar. Um, there is a massive underreporting in any census data of minorities. That's because where the, where the religious and ethnic minorities live, these are usually areas that are not under government control. So it's very hard to have a census in an area that you don't control. Right? And there is a massive underrepresentation, as you can see here, of Muslims. And the reason for that is that many of the Rohingya don't have citizenship. So they are not counted in a census. Okay. So, um, and many Burmese Muslims don't report that they are Muslims because Muslims are generally discriminated in Burmese society. Um, so I have a good friend of mine. He is a Burmese Muslim. So he's not a Rohingya. He's Burmese, but he is a Muslim. He would never, in a sense, announce that he's a Muslim. Right? He would always say, either I'm Buddhist or I don't want to declare my religion. Right? And that says because otherwise it would have severe consequences for him, for his job, for his family, etc., etc. Um, that's also something where all the other religions are more or less, they have a lot of conflict. There's a lot of conflicts between Christians and Buddhists. But the one thing they all have in common is that they hate Muslims. There's a deep ingrained racism and religious intolerance towards Muslims. Um, and that's something, you know, I found very hard to comprehend when people talk about the Rohingya crisis and all of a sudden people. That, that you value and you like and you think they are tolerant and liberal tell you that this is justified and that the country needs to protect itself and that of course these people need to go back to Bangladesh. That's where they came from. Right? And you think like, oh, I don't know. That's pretty much ethnic cleansing you're doing. Right? So um, it's a very, very intolerant, a very, very racist and exclusionist society. Uh, Myanmar still has marriage laws that forbid people from different religions to marry each other. Right? So they have very strict laws. They're not very well enforced. <laughs> Problem is, when it comes to enforcement of any kind of laws, you, you need to think of Myanmar as a country that not only had 60 years of military dictatorship, but also 60 years of ethnic conflict, which means it's de facto failed state right? in, in many aspects. Um, you have very rigid laws that nobody follows. Right? Okay. Uh, laws are very, very selectively uh, implemented. I mean, I always play a game when I enter Myanmar. Um, I play a game called um, Visa Bingo. Because I've entered the country now seven times and four times I've had a different visa. Even though I have an invitation letter that says, please issue the gentleman a business visa on arrival. Sometimes I get a social visa, sometimes I get a tourist visa, sometimes I get a business visa for 70 days, I've had a business visa for three months before. Um, it's because the border guards don't know their own rules. Right? Policy is not properly implemented. As long as you're able to pay the fee in dollars, you always end up getting a visa. It's just a question of what kind of visa it will be. Right? So I always call it visa bingo. So. And, that's, and that's a key problem. That's, I mean, that's just an example where you think, ah, kind of border guard should know the rules. Uh, they don't. Um, right? So, um, and, and this is just an example of how selective certain rules are followed up. Uh, of course, people marry between different religions. Nobody's there to follow that up. Right? The only laws that are really fully implemented are the laws that protect the military. Right? If you do anything to harm the military, you will get arrested. Right? Um, but there are many other laws, which are many things that I didn't know should be laws. Right? Um, 
There's about 55 million inhabitants of Myanmar. <laughs> Again, we had a census in 2008, um, two weeks after Storm Nargis killed about half a million people. Really bad idea to do a census, you know, two weeks after the biggest natural disaster in the country. Right? People have other problems than participating in the population count. Um, and again, the census data we have only relate to those areas under the control of the government. Okay, um, so a quarter of the country still is not controlled by the government. Okay, and I'll give you some examples of which areas these are. Um, the majority group are the Burma, the majority religion is uh, Theravada Buddhism. Now, again, B will know much more about this than I do, but the Theravada form of Buddhism is very, very important, right? Because that's not the kind of Buddhism that, you know, the general population thinks of when they think of Buddhism. This kind of nice, you know, um, form of Buddhism, of praying, of Tibet, of peacefulness. Theravada Buddhism is a very politically active Buddhism. Okay? And it's a very exclusive form of Buddhism. Okay? It's not very tolerant towards other religions. Um, there are some religious minorities which are Christian, some which are Rohingya, some which are mixed. But there are also ethnic minorities which are Buddhist. For example, Rakhine people. Right? So the Rakhine population, this is where the Rohingyas live, the Rakhine see themselves as different from the Burma, but they are Buddhist. But they say ethnically, we are different. We are our own different group, even though we have the same religion. Okay? Um, there's a lot of conflicts. Um, there is an ethnic conflict between minority and majority groups. Um, there is a religious conflict. Um, there's a big question of Buddhism as state religion. Now, in the 1960s, Buddhism was made the state religion of Myanmar. And I will show you the man who did that, was General Ne Win. Um, in the 2008 constitution, in the latest constitution, Buddhism is not the state religion, but it is a so-called preferential religion. So it has a higher status compared to other religions. Okay, it's more protected by the constitution. The constitution does not accept religious freedom. It's not one of the rights you have. But it recognizes that Buddhism has a special status and it recognizes there are other religions as well. So it's like if you ever want to have fun reading a constitution, read the 2008 constitution. It's a horrible constitution. It's very poorly written, it's very repetitive, but it has some, some provisions in you will, you will shake your head. It has like a provision on the equality of men and women, where it says like, men and women are equal and should find equal employment, except in those jobs that can only be done by men. <laughs> right? I mean, this is like, wow! You know? And it has some provisions in where you go like, wow! I mean, it's, it's um, absolutely amazing that this is still in the, in the Constitution. Um, and you have a societal conflict, and the Tatmadaw is the name for the Burmese military. Okay? Um, now, for that, you need to know the history. Myanmar has been a military dictatorship between 1963 and 2010. Okay? Um, in that period, um, there have been two very important military dictators. General Ne Win, who um, staged the first military coup in 1963, ending a very short period of very instable parliamentary democracy. And then secondly, um, General Tan Shui, who took over in 1991, and he was the one who started the process of democratization. Okay, Tan Shui is still alive. He lives in a massive villa in Nepidon, in the new capital, and he still has a lot of influence on what's going on in Myanmar. Now, when we talk about democratization, I'll come back to that, uh, Myanmar is not a functioning democracy. Right? And they have elections which are reasonably free and fair. But 25% of the seats in parliament are reserved for military personnel. They are appointed by the commander-in-chief. Three ministers are appointed by the commander-in-chief. Defense Minister, the Border Affairs Minister, and the uh, uh, Home Secretary, the one who controls the police, still appointed by the, by the military. 
The military has its own budget, which is not discussed as part of the state budget. And the commander-in-chief is basically, if not the most important political figure, it's a very, very dominant political figure. And the military also has a majority in the state National Security Council. And the National Security Council can declare a state of emergency, at which point all power goes to the commander-in-chief. So they abolish parliament, they abolish government, give all power to the commander-in-chief. That council has 11 members, six of them are military. Okay. Now why is that important? That is important when you consider the international press in relation to the Rohingya crisis. Because the international press has been very critical of Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, Aung San Suu Kyi is the leader of the democratic civilian government. Her power to do anything or even say anything is very, very limited due to the substantial influence of the military. Okay? She's got nothing to gain. The worst that can happen is the military take over power. She again ends up in prison. Right? Um, if she would say something, um, nothing would change because the military is not under civilian control. And more importantly, and we shouldn't forget that, is the majority of the population supported the military action. Right? So for her to remain quiet is, even if it might be morally wrong, politically completely um, understandable. Not, not right, but understandable. Right. Um, the relations between the different groups and the different religions um, have always been one of cooperation and conflict, and they've always been mixed. Um, the, there's a very important conference that took place in 1947, the so-called Panglong Conference. That, was, that laid the foundation of the modern Burmese independent state. Now, this is important because um, Burma was under a British mandate, was a British colony before the Second World War, then it was conquered by the Japanese, and then the Brits took charge of it after the war again. And when it became independent, um, the Brits um, said, right, there is two options. Either we have an independent state of Burma, so the heartland Burma, and then the minority areas can also become independent. They would have a Shan state, a Shin state, a Kachin state. Or they said to the father of the nation, a guy called Aung San, they said, or you make an agreement with the so-called hill people, the minorities. And that agreement was a Panglong agreement. That basically said, we will give extensive rights to the ethnic minorities, okay? um, including the right to become independent. Right? Now, why is that important? Two major reasons. Number one, Mr. An Fang was very um, untimely assassinated. Um, shortly after the Panglong Conference, he was killed by his own people. Um, he was 27 years old when he died. But at the age of 27, he already had two children. Right? One of them was a son. Um, and one of them was a daughter. And your daughter is named after the name of the father. So the name of the founding father of the state is An Sang. The name of the current state councillor is An Sang Su Chi. Her father is the, fa is the founding father of an independent Burma. That's very important, and she plays that myth very, very well. Right? But there's something else important here. Namely, the Panglong is important because it gave a promise to different minority groups. Right? It was a promise, this idea that Burma would not be a state dominated by one group or one religion. It would be a multi-religious, multi-ethnic, federal state in which all group rights would be protected. So that was a promise that came from Pang Long. That was never implemented. An Sang was shot. First parliamentary democracy did not implement the Pang Long Agreement was very, very instable. Myanmar, or Burma at the time, had a very strong communist insurgency supported from China. Um, and finally, in 1961 and 62, there was another meeting of minority representatives in Shan State in the town of Tongji. 
And there they agreed that they would have a new list of demands. And they said if their demands are met, the ethnic groups would stop fighting and would support an independent Burmese state. That Taungji document was accepted by parliament and was one of the reasons that General Nevin used his Deja coup. Because he said, if we give more rights to minorities, the state will fall apart. They only want to be independent. Okay? Now, if you look at a map, do we have a map? We have a map at the beginning. Um, the ethnic minorities, right? Shan, Kachin, Chin, uh, later also the Mon, they are all in areas where technically they could be independent, right? They are bordering neighboring states, um, but some of them, for example, are quite big. Shan State is quite big. Kachin State is small but very rich in natural resources. So these states could actually function as independent states. Okay. Um, so the whole debate um, started around, you know, what is the Burmese state? And what does it represent? And how can it include the many religious, ethnic, language groups that exist in the country? That debate goes on until today. It's at the heart of the current peace process. Okay, so um, in general, um, the 2008 constitution creates what I call a facade federal system. It's a highly centralized state where everything is controlled by the union government in Nepidal. Right? Um, if you ever have the chance to get to Myanmar, I highly recommend you go to Nepidal. Nepida was the city that was built in the 1980s by the military government. Um, and it feels like a ghost town. It's completely empty. The only people that live there are civil servants who work in the ministry. It's a friend of mine calls it the empty city. It's a city that has five, six lane motorways throughout the city, but no cars. It's a total contrast to Yangon, which has lots of cars, but not enough you know, lanes. Right? And it, it feels so strange. When you, when you drive in, in Naypyidaw, everything is very big. And when you think about 30 years ago, this was all jungle. Right? They built the city in the middle of the jungle. Uh, it, it's very, very surreal. Uh, I mean, I haven't been to Astana in Kazakhstan, but I imagine that would be very similar. Um, but it feels like a very strange city. And you're in a bubble there. In Naypyidaw, it's the only place where you don't have regular electricity cuts, where you can drink water from the pipes. It has clear drinking water. Right? So they, you have very good internet. I have fascinatingly fast internet uh, in Nepido. In Yangon, you always sit that way, that way, that way. Right? In Nepido, uh, you feel like you're in a bubble. Uh, but Nepido as a capital has not been recognized by many uh, foreign uh, um, countries. So most of the embassies, with the exception of the People's Republic of Korea, um, all the other embassies are still in Yangon. Most ministries still have offices in Yangon. Most international aid agencies work through Yangon. They have like a representative office in Nepidaw, but they work in Yangon. So Yangon remains a center of activity. But of course, all the ministries, all the government, all the important government agencies sit in Nepidaw. Right? Um, between Yangon and Nepidaw, it's about um, 200 miles. And they've built a highway, the Napido Highway, which is fascinating because, um, you know, light is a very flexible concept in Myanmar. So if lots of cars at night that don't have any light. You have people walking on the Napido Highway. So um, I've driven on there once and it's quite an experience. You um, have to be very, very focused. Um, so it's a very, I don't need to go through that in detail, but it's a very centralized country. Right, power lies with the government agents in, in Nepida. Problem is that the civil service is very badly qualified. Um, laws are very poorly implemented. That's partly because there's a lack of human resources, but more importantly, there's a lack of financial resources. Myanmar is one of the poorest countries in the world. Right? Um, I sometimes tell people this funny story. So when I got this email in May, and I, uh, last year, to go to Myanmar. 
And I said, yes, and we had agreed everything. I went to my doctor and I said, okay, look, I'm going to Myanmar. Is there any shots I need? Is there any, can there any medical advice you have for me beyond what the STO website says? Right? And my doctor, who had never been in this area of the world before, looked at the FCO website and said to me, and I quote, make sure you have a travel insurance that flies you to Bangkok and Cape Yoel. Right? Because the healthcare system is so appalling in Myanmar that they say as soon as you have anything, that means they have to cut you open. Right? From a break to, I don't know, you need some form of surgery, go to Bangkok, go to Thailand. Right? Bangkok or Singapore, where you get um, very much Western-style healthcare. But they said, don't go into a Myanmar hospital other than you, if you need a few antibiotics. Right? Other, anything beyond that, fly to Bangkok. This is a doctor who had never been to that region, but said, this is what the FCO says. And this gives you an impression of the, of the kind of situation in the country. Right? and of the healthcare standard, and of the general functionality of the country. Um, and, and part of that is a legacy of military dictatorship. Part of this is a legacy of high centralization. Everything is controlled from NAPIDA. Right? NAPIDA decides where hospitals are being built, without having a clue what's going on in half the country. Right? And it's based on a very poor, it's a legacy of a very poor education system as well. Remember, Myanmar regularly had student protests starting in 76 when Utan died, the former uh, UN Secretary General. He was Burmese, very outspoken against military government. He died first student unrest, universities shut for three years. Right? Then you have the 1988 protests, uh, which were a result of rising fuel prices, um, but also uh, a general recognition of how poor the country has become. Again, for four years, universities completely shut in the country. Right? Then you have a new uprising, 1996. Um, the 96th generation, again, they closed universities for three years. So you have a whole generation of people who haven't had a chance to go to university. It's only now that there's a beginning vibrancy again in academia. Right? Um, and it's really sad because what the military did after it reopened university after 1988, uh, it destroyed most university buildings and rebuilt those universities outside of town. So that basically if the student protest it doesn't affect the town. Right? So it doesn't affect the city or the town. So uh, very strategic thinking, but it also takes whole student life out. I mean, if you go to the university in Mandalay, it's miles out. You have to drive half an hour outside of Mandalay before you get to the university. Right? And you know, the only reason for that is, so if the student's protesting, it won't connect with the rest of the population of the city. Right? Um, so you have a very poor standard of education, particularly of skilled education. The standard of literacy, for example, is very high. Right? 97% of the population can read and write. Um, but in terms of higher skilled education, the standard is very low because universities have been shut for years and still um, suffer um, of, of a lack of finances. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the whole conflict in Myanmar um, has come in phases and it has, has had different uh, kind of you know, topics or themes, if you so want. In, in the early part of the independence of the country, a lot of the war was on the one side, the Communist Party, and should Myanmar be more toward the capitalist system, toward the US, more toward the Soviet Union, toward China, but also what's the role of the ethnic groups? Should they be independent? So a lot of the ethnic conflict was about secession, okay? becoming independent. In 89-90, that shifted because you not only had now the conflict between the Burma and the ethnic groups, but you clearly had a conflict within the Burma, with the rise of the 88 generation and the National <coughs> League for Democracy. Okay? Um, so the focus here became democracy, focus became regional development. Um, nowadays, because you have so many overlapping conflicts, the main focus is peace. How do you bring peace to a country in which you have something around 16 ethnic armed organizations? Right? At least 16 recognized ones. There are even more who are not recognized. 
Okay? Now, many of these ethnic armed organizations are very small. Right? My friend from ABSDS, um, All Burma Student Democratic Front, these are the students that in 1988 went into the jungle to, uh, after the military used violence against the student protesters, and they took up arms um, to fight the military government. Uh, they have maybe 200 fighters, they're very small. But some of these ethnic groups, particularly the Wa, the Kachin, uh, they have 30, 40, 50,000 men under arms. Right? I mean, the WA are very strongly supported from China. They have anti-tank missiles, they have anti-aircraft missiles. Right? These are not small insurgents that you can underestimate. Okay? So the question is, how can you bring peace to such a country? How can you pacify uh, the country in, with such a diversity? And this is where I come in. <laughs> not that I will bring peace, I would never claim to do this, but in 2015, they have signed a so-called nationwide ceasefire agreement, which eight out of the 16 ethnic groups have signed. Of the 16 armed groups, eight have signed that. And that includes a commitment of a democratization of the political system and of the introduction of federalism um, and more autonomy for the ethnic minorities. And they are now in the process, in a peace negotiation, a process called the Panglong Conference for the 21st century. Um, that name was chosen by Aung San Suu Kyi, very much a tradition of her father. Um, they are discussing how can Myanmar become a federal country. And as part of this, they are looking for a lot of uh, technical assistance from people who understand what federalism means, how it can be implemented, how it works in other countries, and that's my research area. That's what I'm interested in. Okay. So this is where I come in. And uh, very recently I have been there and I've worked with some NGO representatives on their role in the peace process. And very importantly, we've worked with some academics to, for the first time, kind of train academics in what federalism is, how it could be studied academically, but also why this is relevant for the political system of Myanmar. Um, and that was very, very good. Um, we do a lot of work with civil servants um, because they have to implement federalism. Federalism works because civil servants make it work. Right? Um, and we do a lot of work with uh, political parties, um, all political parties, including uh, the NLD, but also uh, the USDP, which is the party of the military. So we work with them as well. And we do a lot of work with ethnic armed organizations. Before they signed the ceasefire, they would have been called terrorists. Now they are ethnic armed organizations. The first thing I learned in Myanmar, um, in conflict, um, there is no good side. Right? Um, everybody's dodgy. If you accept that, then you know, um, morally you feel better. Right? You say, look, I'll talk to everybody who wants to talk about peace and who wants to bring peace to the country. That includes the military. I, um, we've done a workshop in August with the military, with some of the teachers at the um, uh, military academy, uh, the defense academy in Pinovin. And these are the people who train future military leaders. Right? And we've done a workshop with them on the idea of what is federalism and what's the role of the military in a federal state. And that was very, very, very interesting to kind of get a bit of a feeling of their thinking and their ideas. Um, many of those people are not nice people, right? Um, many of the ethnic uh, armed groups that we work with are involved in drug smuggling, weapon smuggling, human uh, trafficking, right? Um, but the alternative is to say we do not work with you, at which point surely there will be no peace. So if the greater aim is to stop suffering, you have to accept the fact that you have to work with people who might be very dodgy. Okay? And I, I mean, my rule always is I don't ask any question about the background of people. Right? Um, and, and that helps. Okay? And the other thing is you need to, you know, when you come back to Christchurch, report selectively whom you work with. <laughs> because otherwise our ethics committee would have been you know, had a few problems with, with some of the people. But I mean, I give you an example. Um, 
the former Speaker of the Parliament, he is now the leader of the Interparliamentary Commission on Democratization and State Reform, right? which is the closest parliamentary commission they have on federalism. Right? They don't call it federalism, but that's what it does. Now, his name is Schwemann. He has become one of the biggest promoters of federalism on the side of the party that's close to the military. Right? So he is seen as a moderate. He's still very influential. Right? And he really wants to push this idea of federalism. Now, if you look up Schwemann on his Wikipedia site, Right? You will see that the guy has been accused numerous times by the UN of uh, crimes against humanity because he was a senior general in the military who was involved in numerous military campaigns that involved ethnic cleansing and the bombing of civilians. Basically, he's not a nice person. But he is somebody who really wants to do something that could bring peace to the country. Right? And if it stops the fighting, then our logic is, my logic is, we will work. Um, that's a difficult, sometimes a difficult moral choice to make, but um, you know, I always have to think of um, my colleagues who negotiated the Good Friday Agreement. You couldn't have the Good Friday Agreement for peace in Northern Ireland if you wouldn't have spoken to Sinn Féin. And by speaking to Sinn Féin, you knew that the leadership of Sinn Féin and the leadership of the IRA are the same. Right? So you had to accept that you're probably in a room with people who've committed murder, right? Who've, who've killed innocent people as part of a political campaign. And yet, they, talking to those people is key to peace, right? Peace talks means you have to speak to people who might be very nasty, people you wouldn't normally speak to. So um, I've stopped asking questions about the background of people. Not because I don't believe in morals, I do, but, you know, um, Sometimes you need to make nasty choices when you talk about peace. You have to work with people who um, have committed some very, very serious crimes. Okay, but that's not for me to judge. Who am I to judge that? Right. Now, where are we today? Um, there's an ongoing peace process and an ongoing democratization process. So questions are being asked about when will the military leave politics, when will the federal reforms be implemented. Those things are being discussed, and this is where I come in and work with different stakeholders. And, and the work we do kind of encompasses um, three elements. The first one is basically public awareness raising. This idea of telling people this is what federalism means and this is the opportunities it opens up for Myanmar. The second thing is um, we actually do political advice and consultancy. So particularly with the ethnic armed organizations who have signed the ceasefire agreement, before any peace negotiations, we usually have a briefing. And we discuss what their demands are, how is this reasonable to frame the demand, how they should justify it, what might be different compromises they can make in the peace negotiations. So this is like directly trying to influence the outcome of the peace negotiations. Um, and the third thing we'll do is... Um, kind of, um, we're trying to bring stakeholders together. So the last time I was there, we had designed a new program called the Myanmar Federalism Leadership Program, in which we got 40 people from very different backgrounds, ethnic armed groups, political parties, civil service, military, um, students, academics. We got them together for 10 days in a hotel in Nepidor, so they couldn't escape. Right? It's a little bit like you know, holding them prisoner. For 10 days, we really discussed different aspects of federalism. And for the first time, some of those political party activists will have spoken to military people and vice versa. Right? And these people go back to their jobs having a completely different um, uh, perspective. A and that was a big success. And we're going to continue doing that because this is at a low level, getting people together to exchange ideas. Um, there's a big question over what should happen with the military. You can't just think of the military as a political actor. Military are also highly influential economically. The two biggest conglomerates in the country are owned by the military. Um, the biggest beer brewery is owned by the military. 
And the biggest money in Myanmar is in natural resources, Myanmar jade, but also oil, gas, um, that's controlled by the military. Uh, so for them, it's not just about keeping you know, your hand in the political process, it's also thinking about you know, how do I keep control over my economic interests. Okay? The role of civil society, uh, this is what gives me hope, I always say to my colleagues in Myanmar, we need to do something with civil society because this is usually very positive and these are often uh, not just young but people from all age groups, from very different backgrounds, who say, look, usually I don't have a lot uh, to do with politics, but I kind of you know, want to support the peace process and I want to make life better for my community. And this is really, you know, when I see this, this is for me always the cornerstone for democracy. This is what you need. You need those activists to say we want to make a difference. Right? Um, and you see more and more of those in Myanmar. This is what gives me hope. That you see, I mean, I've been to some of the rural areas and you see civil society activists there. Um, the role of ordinary citizens. 80% um, of the population live in rural areas. 60% of the population don't have access to sanitation, right? Half of the population doesn't have access to electricity. I mean, sometimes when I'm there, I need to, you know, remind me of those facts because I work in a bubble, right? I'm in places where there is sanitation, where there is electricity. Cuts, cuts off every once in a while, but you have electricity, right? But you have to think about, well, this political system we are trying to build here needs to address the needs of those people as well, right? They need to implement it. They are the ones who have to live in it, right? And then finally, the ethnic groups. Yeah, some have signed the ceasefire, others have not, so it's becoming very complicated. Um, we can skip that. Now, let me say a few words about Buddhism. Um, <laughs> that's a Buddhism and beyond in the title. Um, I think the role of uh, Buddhism and uh, the role of religion themselves reflects many of the conflicts in Myanmar. So the man you see on your left um, is General Nevin. He was the one who came to power in 1963 in a military coup. And in, the, in the late 1960s, he made Buddhism the official religion of the country. By that, of course, alienating all other ethnic groups. Right? Um, Nevin himself not only was a, was a very strict Buddhist, but he also believed in a lot of, like, in fortune tellers and in stars, and there were all kind of things that, um, I mean, at some point he had introduced a currency reform because a fortune teller told him, your lucky number is nine. So all the banknotes overnight became invalid, and new banknotes that had the number nine on them were introduced, making basically half the population completely poor. Because you don't have a savings account there, you just have cash at home. Right? Um, so um, it's absolutely, I mean, if you hear some of the stories, some of the decisions that were taken, right? Uh, even the 2008 constitution. Um, 2008 constitution officially says there are 135 national races in Myanmar. Now you can say, okay, somebody you know paid an anthropologist to do some counting. Uh, they didn't. They came up with a random figure, but the figure isn't that random because one plus three plus five gives us which number, right? So this is how politics is made in Burma. I mean, this is like. Um, absolutely shocking, some of those decisions. Um, so he introduced Buddhism as, as, as state religion, thereby exaggerating ethnic conflict. Okay? Now, then we have her. This is Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, she doesn't look her best anymore. She is 73. So she isn't the youngest anymore. One of the big worries of the peace process and what happens if she dies. Um, because there's nobody in line to succeed her. Uh, she has become, particularly since becoming a uh, state councillor, which is like a prime minister post, um, very close to Buddhist monks and to Buddhism as a religion. 
before that, she, she tried to play the argument, I'm standing above it. She is a Buddhist herself, she is Bama herself, but she's always said, I represent all the people, right? I represent everybody. Since 2015, she's moved a lot in the direction of saying, I represent the Bama and I represent Buddhism. And she's openly gone to pray with the monks and to, to symbolize her sympathy, which again alienates her from many of the minority groups who supported the NLD in the 2015 elections. So again, this is a reflection of some of the religious content. Uh, this picture here is 2007 Saffron Revolution. Okay? In 2007, the military government announced an increase in uh, fuel prices. And even a small increase in fuel prices in one of the poorest countries in the world can make a massive difference. Right? So this led to a lot of protests, which immediately were shut down by the military. Um, over 400 people were killed, were shot on the street, and that led to an uproar of the monks. That is the first time that it was a demonstration mainly led by monks. That's why it's called the Saffron Revolution in relation to the monk dress. Right? Now, why is that important? Um, two major reasons. Number one, monks are supposed to be non-political. They're not allowed to vote. They're not allowed to join a political party. Even being active in civil society is always seen as you're kind of overstepping the mark. Right? So the fact that the monks went out in a political protest against the military regime right, um, is highly significant. Not least because the military regime has always seen itself also as the defenders of Buddhism. When then the monks come out and say, no, you're not, it's highly, uh, highly, highly problematic. But secondly, where did the monks go in Yangon? They went to the house of Aung San Suu Kyi where she was held under house arrest. So thereby giving their approval to, you are our democratic leader. You are the one who brings this country forward. Right? So making a very clear, not just anti-military me uh, message, but also pro-NLD and Sang Suu Kyi message. And the 2007 Saffron Revolution is very, very symbolically important. And because it's the beginning of the end of military dictatorship. That connected with a storm Nargis, 2008, um, kind of led to a point where the military realized we're not going to hold on to power forever. But of course, um, as you can see above, um, the monks can also be very, very politically active against other groups. Against the Rohingya, many monks have spoken out and said, yes, they don't belong in the country. Yes, they should be forced to leave. Um, many um, monks are politically highly conservative. So in, 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 in Myanmar, you can get arrested if you have a tattoo of the Buddha and you openly show it, right? Because visual images of the Buddha are forbidden, right? So I have a colleague who has a big Buddha tattoo. He always has to wear at least an elbow length shirt. Right. You can cover it up, it's not an issue, but if you wear it openly, you can get arrested. There is the story that happened last time I was there um, of the um, Dutch holidaymaker. Um, it was a tourist who came to Myanmar, and he traveled the country, and he spent a couple of days in Mandalay, and he booked a hotel, and unfortunately, <laughs> when doing certain uh, seasons, doing certain prayer times, Buddhists get out a speaker, get out a microphone, and they pray. And these pray prayers are not like your two-hour church prayer. They can go on for hours and hours and hours. And that Dutch tourist had the unfortunate situation where a very well-conditioned monk was praying outside his hotel room. And he complained at the hotel reception, and he said, look, I can't sleep, I can't work. This is crazy, right? Can you give me a different room? No, we can't. So he got really frustrated, went outside and basically kicked the speaker of the, of the electrical system. Right? He was arrested because um, that's blasphemy. That's a crime. Okay? 
he was sentenced to four years in prison, right? And he was only released after three weeks to, to, to be sent back to the Netherlands <coughs> because basically the EU intervened and said, this is not acceptable. We will not accept it. <coughs> but there are still very strict laws on blasphemy. There are still very strict interpretations of what Buddhism is and is not. And there are still very strict um, protections of monks, of religious institutions. Right? There are certain things that you can't do, and if you do them, there's a good chance you will get arrested. Right? And you can feel that in the, also in, for example, areas of freedom of speech. You can now sit in a restaurant and criticize the commander-in-chief. You can criticize Aung San Suu Kyi. That is okay to do in the public. You shouldn't say the commander-in-chief is an asshole. <laughs> that was recently done by one of the deputy ministers of the NLD. He now sits in prison. Um, so that's a bit too far, but you can be critical. Um, so freedom of speech has made big progression in a country that had thousands and thousands of political prisoners 10 years ago. Uh, but there are certain things you can't criticize can't criticize Buddhism, right? <clears throat> you can't generally criticize the military beyond a certain point, right? Uh, you can't criticize in any shape or form monks, right? I mean, the country has um, estimations, say, between 600 and 700,000 monks, right? Now, you might think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's 700,000 people that don't work and live off the nation. Right? That's a substantial amount of the workforce. Right? Um, so, um, a friend of mine always says, problem with Myanmar is everybody wants to be either a monk or a king. Nobody wants to be a worker in between. So you can't just be a monk or a king. Right? So... Um, Buddhism still plays a very, very important role. And um, one of the things we always discuss when we talk about you know, a future constitution is we say, what about religion? What, what do you want with religion? And the ethnic groups are very clear. They say we need a secular state. Right? Because they say the alternative to a secular state is not a state that accepts multiple religions. The alternative to a secular state is, again, a state where Buddhism is state religion. So in order to avoid that, we need to agree that state and religion are separated. Which, according to the kind of Buddhism practiced in Myanmar, is very difficult. Right? Because there, Buddhism affects all parts of life, including politics. We've come to the end. This is the last slide, I promise. Okay. Um, so where are we? Uh, the whole process is still very fragile. Um, it's by far not a consolidated peace process, not a consolidated democracy. Um, the military still holds a disproportionate amount of power. And uh, it's not clear whether they will and when they will step down from, from politics. Okay. One needs to be clear what the commitment of different actors is, including the ethnic armed groups. What is their commitment? Are they really committed to the process? Um, because at least some of them, they benefit from the status quo. If you think of the Wah or the Kachin Independence Army, they control large amounts of territory, they have thousands of troops under their control, they run their own social uh, welfare system, their own hospitals, their own schools. For them, the current situation is actually good. Right? For them, change can be problematic. <coughs> How inclusive is the process, taking into account that only some groups have signed the ceasefire, only some groups are part of the peace negotiations, others are not? What's the role and interest of other countries, particularly China? China plays a double-edged uh, sword in, um, in Myanmar. On the one side, it has very close relations with the Myanmar military and supports their modernization process. On the other side, it has strong military support, particularly for the Wah Independence Army, for one of the ethnic armed groups. 
there will be a question about economic development. Economic development is very uneven in Myanmar. Some of the bigger cities, particularly Yangon, to some extent also Myanmar, Bagan, they are seeing economic development. They are seeing increased tourism, increased investment. Right? Um, other areas, the majority of the country don't benefit. So um, it's very uneven. It can be very dangerous for the political setting, right? Because in the moment you create jobs, you create a private sector, right? you create a middle class, people don't want to join the military. Right? At the moment, the military is good for you because even though you only earn about $150 a month, but they give you three warm meals a day, they provide accommodation for you and your family. They give your wife a job somewhere in the kitchen, so you're taken care of. Which, you know, if the alternative is being a farmer somewhere in rural Myanmar, military is a better option. When instead of the military, you can choose to, I don't know, become a burger flipper at McDonald's in, in Yangon, where you earn three times what you would earn in the military, right? then maybe this is a better choice. Right? So economic development can upset the political system. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of conflict legacies. I mean, we sometimes we pretend all it needs is a p peace treaty and then everything is great. But there are something like 3 million refugees and internally displaced persons right, who are living either in the country or in neighboring countries. These people should have a right to come back home. Right? And they need to be reintegrated. Often their villages were burned down. Right? So um, these conflict legacies play a key role. Uh, transitional justice is a very difficult topic. It's difficult because some civil society organizations are pushing for it. They are saying those particular those generals that have committed severe crimes should be punished. But of course, this is a process that's been introduced by the military. So to think that there will ever be any court cases against the generals is very, very unlikely. Uh, and that's depressing, and that's sad, and that's you know, morally very, very difficult to deal with. Um, on the other side, um, you know, there are countries that have successfully democratized without addressing the crimes of the past. In Europe, um, um, Spain and Greece are examples of that. They never had a proper process of transitional justice. Right? Um, and it takes a lot of time. I mean, Argentina is only now coming to terms with the legacy of the military dictatorship in the 1970s and 80s. Okay. And of course, you have the ongoing religious conflict, not just between uh, Buddhists and other religious minorities, but also within Buddhism. You have different forms of Buddhism. And you have a growing middle class, you have a growing educational elite who consider themselves Brahman. If you ask them for their religion, they will say, I'm a Buddhist. But they are in no way, shape, or form practicing Buddhists. Um, and that's also becoming more and more prevalent, particularly in the big cities. Okay. That was indeed the last slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you have any questions?